Comrades, brothers and sisters, it has been two years since the last general election. We've had a full agenda, and all of you in the party and in the union has been kept busy. The MPs and activists in our 89 branches have been diligently working with residents, listening to their concerns, attending to their needs, improving their lives, and also sharing with Singaporeans what the PAP government is doing on popular issues as well as difficult ones. For example, how we are increasing early childhood places, building new hospitals and healthcare facilities, but also why water tariffs have to go up and why we are making changes to the elected presidency. The young PAP, the Women's Wing, PAP SG, and the PAP Policy Forum have also been active in their own areas. I'm happy that today we have recognized 359 comrades for long and outstanding service. Many of you have served for decades and two for 50 years. Thank you all for your commitment and service to the party. I listened to the speeches by the four comrades just now, com three comrades and one brother, although there are four comrades and more than one brother, because some of them are both party and union members. Comrade Yulin spoke about jobs and the economy, an issue that's on the top of Singaporeans' minds. Comrade Ashifa spoke about maintaining Singapore's place in the world. Comrade Jagas Tiswaran spoke about maintaining our social compact with citizens. And Brother David spoke about the symbiotic relationship between the PAP and the NTUC. All four of these are issues critical to Singapore's survival, stability, and success. And I'm glad the younger generation is acutely aware of them. In fact, I would like to talk about these topics too and give you my take on them. Let me start with foreign relations, which has to do with our place in the world, and recap what we have been doing in these last two years. Our relations with our big powers, with America and China, are in good order. I've just visited both of them in recent months. In September, I had a good visit to China. They invited me even though it was just before the 19th Party Congress, and I was happy to accept. I had good meetings with the senior leaders, including President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang. Both sides value the relationship, and I discussed with the Chinese leaders new areas of cooperation. Last month, I visited the US and met President Donald Trump and his key officials just before their trip to Asia. I shared with them my perspectives, including how Asian countries wanted the US to stay engaged in the region. I touched base with senators and congressmen and with US policy thinkers, because we have a wide network in America, many friends at many levels. And I'm there. We are a small country. They are a big one. I'm there to keep Singapore a blip on their radar screen, so they notice us. It's not always easy to be good friends with both the US and China at the same time. But as a small nation, we have to make friends with as many countries as we can. So we have to work hard to tend our relationships with both the US and China while upholding Singapore's own interests. And I think we have not done too badly. Near the home, near the home, relations with our neighbors, our immediate neighbors, are also good. I hosted a retreat with President Jokowi in September, and next month I'm hosting a retreat with Prime Minister Najib Razak. We are doing a lot with both Indonesia and Malaysia. Singapore is the largest foreign investor in both countries, 
and also the largest number, also produce the largest number of tourists to both countries. And we have several major projects with them. With Indonesia, the Kendal Industrial Park, which is at Semarang. And we're also developing modular LNG plants, electricity plants, for Indonesia's regions. Because it's a big country, they need electricity in many different places. And with a small LNG plant, you can deliver the electricity and send the natural gas there. With Malaysia, we are building the high-speed rail to KL and the rapid transit link to Johor Bahru, which we will sign the agreement for the RTL next month. But our relations with Malaysia and Indonesia will always be complex, and issues will crop up from time to time. You take Pedra Branca, for example. It's an old subject. We thought the issue was settled permanently long ago because in 2008, the Interna International Court of Justice made a ruling, final, awarded Pedra Branca to Singapore. But almost a decade later, the Malaysians have gone to the ICJ again and they're asking the court to reinterpret and revise the judgment, reopening the subject. I'm not sure what the Malaysians' motive is, but the general election is coming, and maybe that has something to do with it. And in Indonesia, although our relations are good, politicians have been talking about taking back their airspace from Singapore. Actually, this is not about Indonesia's airspace, but the FIR, the Flight Information Region, which is for managing air traffic. Singapore manages an FIR around Changi Airport. It includes some areas which are in Indonesian airspace, and Indonesia wants to take back that FIR. But who controls the FIR? It's a technical matter of making the best arrangements for air safety. But unfortunately, it has been politicized and made into an issue of sovereignty and national pride. And when sovereignty and national pride are engaged, that unfortunately makes the problem much harder to solve. So there will always be ups and downs in our relations with our neighbors and with other countries, big and small. Our interests will not always coincide with theirs, but our fundamental approach must not change. Singapore should take a long-term view and work towards good relations that benefit both sides. When relations are going well, we shouldn't take them for granted. More importantly, when relations are down, we must not get flustered or cower. Secondly, while we are friends with many countries, we must not and we must never inadvertently fall under foreign control or influence. No foreign country should ever influence our domestic debate and politics or divide and weaken us, either openly or covertly. It happens. You read about what happens in Australia. They are worried about foreign influence. You read about what happened in the American elections last year, where they are accusing the Russians of trying to influence the elections through Facebook, through Twitter, quietly, secretly. Can it happen to us? Yes, it can. But we must prevent it from happening. And Singaporeans have to understand our core interests so that when we are put to the test, we will stay united and back the government. Then we can stand our ground and defend Singapore's interests as one single cohesive country. On the domestic front, we've also covered a lot of ground. One major task this year was amending the Constitution to make changes to the elected presidency. But apart from that, we've been working on other major policies as well. Our economy is looking up. The world economy is doing quite well, and we are benefiting from that. Our unemployment remains low, 
wages have gone up, and most significantly, productivity has picked up. So this year, growth is good. Initially, we expected 1.5% growth. Then we revised it up to 2 to 3%. Now, it looks like we may exceed 3% growth. But although growth is up, our job is not done. The current upswing is cyclical. To sustain economic growth, we have to press on with plans to restructure and upgrade the economy. Our workers must acquire the right skills and capabilities, must know how to upgrade themselves and be confident about their futures and livelihoods. And our companies also have to adapt, upgrade, and compete in the global marketplace. We set up the CFE last year, the Committee for the Future Economy. Now that's done its work, we have a Future Economy Council to implement the recommendations, and they're doing so progressively. It's a major task. And we have Comrade Heng Sui Kiat, Chan Chun Singh, Ong Yi Kang, and all the other younger ministers closely involved. We have three major strategies for taking care of the workers skills upgrading, jobs matching, and job creation. And the government has reorganized ourselves, realigned our organizations and our agencies so that we focus on each one of them. First, for skills upgrading, to help Singaporeans upgrade and pick up the skills needed for the new jobs of the future, we've created Skills Future Singapore. Secondly, to match our people to quality jobs, we have Workforce Singapore. Thirdly, to support our companies to grow and compete overseas and to create jobs. We are merging IE Singapore in spring to form Enterprise Singapore. So we have each policy, one organization. Focus, get the work done. So we upskill our workers, we match them to jobs, we upgrade our companies, they create new jobs. Restructuring the economy will take effort, but, and we can be sure it won't be a totally smooth journey. But we've done it before and we can do it again. The government will support and help workers and companies. And as long as we stick together and make the effort, we will get it done. Another priority is to improve our infrastructure and especially the public transport system. You heard party chairman this morning. It's not usual that the party chairman starts off telling you about the trains this morning, but I think this morning it was very helpful that he did so. We are improving the network. We've added 1,500 more buses and almost 200 new trains. And this has reduced crowding substantially in the last few years. We are also working hard to improve the train reliability. We've made progress, but there have been setbacks. Last month, there was a tunnel flooding in Bishan. And recently, a few days ago, we had a train collision in Jukun. Singaporeans are frustrated and worried, and understandably so. These incidents should not have happened. But they have, and we must learn the right lessons from them, get to the root of the problems, and put things right. Improving train reliability is a very complicated problem. The technical issues, like re-signaling, is already complex. But we also need to strengthen the organizations to deliver consistent high performance, to reinforce the engineering and the maintenance teams, to maintain morale, raise standards. And these are people issues. And they are delicate, they are crucial, and they take time to sort out. I know Comrade Corbin Wan and his team at MOT and in LTA are extremely disappointed with the recent incidents. They've been working hard tackling the issues one by one. 
The train operators, the SMRT and SBST, and their workers on the ground are disappointed too because they work day and night to improve maintenance and reliability. Actually, their efforts are showing results. If you look at the data, if you look at the numbers, if you calculate up the breakdowns, we are seeing fewer delays and breakdowns than before. But the public doesn't feel it like that. And I can understand why the public doesn't feel it like that. One reason is because when you have a major disruption, like the Pishan flooding or the Jukun collision, the incident looms very large in the public's consciousness. It hurts public confidence a lot. Some commuters are affected, many other trains are running, and the people riding the other trains were not directly affected, but they also feel the psychological impact. A second reason is that we are in the middle of upgrading the old signaling system on the north-south line. And the new system is still being tested and debugged, and that causes their own set of delays. So people see the debugging, people see the delays because of the new signaling coming, being sorted out. They think that something is wrong with a train system. Actually, those problems to do with signaling are problems which are being ironed out. And we are almost done with a north-south line re-signaling. So residents in the north, like in Nisun or Angmokyo or Taupayo, they should see their benefits soon. But having done the north-south line, we will have to do the east-west line re-signaling. And that will inevitably cause some disruptions. We hope less because we've learned lessons from the north-south line. But there will be adjustments and debuggings, and I hope commuters on the east-west line will bear with us. Once the signaling upgrade is fully completed, hopefully within a year's time, these delays should go away. And commuters should see the efforts of our results, the, the fruit of our efforts to improve rail reliability. The transport minister has one of the toughest jobs in cabinet, certainly one of the hottest seats in cabinet. So I want Bunwan and his team to know that they have our full support and confidence. We know it's not easy. We know it takes time. We know they are working hard. There will be hurdles along the way. We will sort them out. The best thing we can now do is to give our transport team the time and the space to work these problems out and deliver a first-class transport system for Singapore. Actually, Actually, if I may be bold and say so, we have a first-class transport system in Singapore, but we want it to be even better. Why do I say we have a first-class transport system? Because you can compare our system with systems in other countries, in other cities in the world. And I was just reading an article which had a long table, different cities and the reliability of the transport system. And it went from New York where 65% of the trains are on time. All the way through other cities in the developed countries in the developing world. And the top cities in the world for reliability of the trains are four. Hong Kong, Taipei, Los Angeles, Singapore. Ninety-nine plus percent on time. So we are not the best. Hong Kong is better. Taipei is better. We will get better. But I think we we will get better. But we must see our problems in perspective, and we must therefore encourage our team. Work at it. Get there.
we are with you. So we are reaching the middle of this term of government. Next year, after the budget, we will prorogue parliament. That means parliament will break. It will open again in a month's time. The president will come, open parliament, deliver the president's address, and set out the agenda for the second half of our term. On the economic front, our strategies and work plans are in place. We have Skills Future SG, we have Workforce SG, we will have Enterprise SG. We have 23 industry transformation maps, industry by industry. We will work at them, bring them up to date, improve them, upgrade them, grow them. And we will help workers make that extra effort to upskill or to move on to new industries growing industries, better jobs. We will support businesses, especially SMEs, to change the way they operate, to grow new markets, to use technology and manpower more efficiently. That we will need unions and employers to work hand in hand with the government. Restructuring is already in progress, and we will press on with it. This is a long-term effort, which will continue beyond this term of government. On infrastructure, we will continue to improve train reliability and to expand the public transport network. Recently, we fully opened the downtown MRT line, and many commuters living in the northeast, northwest and east are happy with it. But the DTL was planned 15 years ago. More MRT lines are in the works. Thompson East Coast Line, and later on, the Cross Island Line and the Jurong Region Line. These will take time to plan, to finance, to build, but when they are done, we will have a more connected and resilient train network. Besides trains, we are also making other major infrastructure investments. We're building the high-speed rail to Kuala Lumpur. The terminus will be here in Jurong. Around the HSR terminus, we will build the new Jurong Lake District. It will become a second CBD, a gateway to Singapore. We are developing other regional centers. Woodlands will have an RTS link to Johor. Pongol will have a new SIT campus and a creative cluster of creative industries. Our air and sea ports, we are building new capacity, doubling the capacity to keep Singapore connected to the world. Terminal 5 at Changi, a mega port at Tuas. And when PSA goes to Tuas, it will free up Tanjung Paga Container Terminal and later the Pasir Panjang Terminal, and that will open up the greater southern waterfront for longer term development. And that's going to be a whole new area, three times the size of Marina Bay. All these will transform our city, enhance our competitiveness, and create more opportunities and jobs for Singaporeans. At the same time, we will strengthen our social resilience. We are enhancing support for young families to give every child a good start and to encourage young couples to have more children. At the rally this year, at the National Day Rally, I talked about investing more in early childhood development. We are adding 40,000 new early childhood places, childcare places, in the next five years. We are building more childcare centers, including 50 more, 50 MOE kindergartens. We are doubling our annual spending on childcare to $1.7 billion. For old folks, we are also helping Singaporeans to live and age well and manage their health care costs. The population is aging rapidly. If we look at the population who are over 65, every year the number goes up, the proportion goes up. This year, one in seven Singaporeans is 65 years old and above. 
Two years ago, it was one in nine. Last year, it was one in eight. This year, it's one in seven. And I joined them. And next year, then, proportion will go up further. By 2030, in less than 15 years' time, it will be one in four. Therefore, demand for healthcare services is rising rapidly. We are restructuring our healthcare system, building more acute hospitals and community hospitals. We are also building more polyclinics, nursing homes, and daycare centers to provide the right type of care for the elderly. We are improving MediShield coverage with MediShield Life. And we are now working on Elder Shield for long term care. We are enhancing programs and facilities to enable, enable old people to stay healthy and active and to be able to contribute to society, to the community. These measures will keep health care affordable to citizens, but definitely health care spending by the state will go up, Have, has already gone up. These investments for our economy, for our infrastructure, and this spending on social services and safety nets, these are all necessary and worthwhile. They are a vote of confidence in Singapore's future. Just as our forefathers saved and invested to build what we, this generation, are enjoying today, so too, this generation, we must plant trees in order that our sons and daughters and their sons and daughters will be able to enjoy the shade. But the investments and the social spending are costly, and we have to make sure that we can afford them. Government spending has gone up, and if we look ahead, it will rise further. So we have to stretch our dollars and make every dollar count. For this current term of government, we have enough revenue, but our spending needs will grow. So Heng Sui Kiat was right when he said that raising taxes is not a matter of whether, but when. Well before that time comes, we have to plan ahead, explain to Singaporeans what the money is needed for, and how the money we earn and we spend will benefit everyone young and old. It will not be easy to do all these things. Upgrade the economy, create good jobs, build world-class infrastructure, prepare for an aging society, and fund our ambitious plans. To implement these policies, they are policies we must get our politics right. And the people must support the PAP. Most of all, they must trust the PAP. They must know that the party cares for them and is working to improve their lives. This doesn't mean the government should only do popular things. From time to time, we also have to make hard choices and take difficult decisions. And when we do so, we must be upfront with Singaporeans, explain to them why we need to do it, get their support for what we need to do. And even if people may not like a specific policy, we must convince them that we are doing it with good intentions and for good reasons. We are fortunate to have inherited a legacy of strong trust between the people and the PAP. The party built this trust up painstakingly over more than 60 years through the efforts of party leaders, MPs, activists, party members. We did so by working with Singaporeans and delivering results, but also through working through difficult policies, whether it was resettlement to build Jurong, whether it's NS to build the SAF, whether it was the GST to fund our programs. The PAP has always been honest with Singaporeans. We don't just tell you what you want to hear, we level with you. Because, and because we have been frank and honest, you know that the PAP means what it says and delivers on what it promises. 
The PAP earned the people's trust the hard way, and we must never take it for granted or fritter it away. In Western democracies today, in many countries, this trust has essentially broken down. The mainstream political parties, Tories and Labour in the UK, the Republicans and the Democrats in the US, are no longer seen to represent the common man's interests. The elites have been disconnected from the population. In America, Donald Trump won the presidential election with the overwhelming support of white working class Americans, people who didn't go to college. Their lives were not improving. They saw other groups moving ahead of them. They felt a sense of hopelessness. They lost faith in their leaders, in the country's leaders, in the elites. Traditionally, the Democrats were the party of the working class, but they had lost touch with this political base. And the, so these white working class Americans voted for Trump, not because he was a traditional Republican, but because, and not because they thought he had a good solution or a better solution to the country's problems, but because they wanted him to break up the system, which was not working for them. So they voted for Trump. It's not working. I don't care. Break it up. When people feel that the current system is no longer work, working for them, they will look for radical alternatives. And in America, the loss of faith wasn't just losing faith in one leader or another leader, one party or another party, but the whole system of politics and government. We must never let this happen in Singapore. The PAP must always pursue policies that benefit the broad majority of Singaporeans. We must always hold the ground, stay close to Singaporeans, maintain their trust and confidence. And voters must always know the PAP is their party, the PAP will work with you, will look after your interests. In the coming years, the, the trust between the PAP and the people will be tested, but it will be more important than ever. Because like other countries, Singapore too will be affected by social and economic disruptions. But unlike other countries, in dealing with these challenges, we must hold together, not pull apart. We need good policies to help Singaporeans cope with these cha changes. We need the good politics. MPs who represent different segments of society. MPs whom Singaporeans will identify with and support. Activists who do community and grassroots work day in, day out, in every branch, every constituency. Key people throughout our society, in the private sector, in the public service, in the social space. People who care for Singapore, who understand what makes this place work, and will work with the PAP government to make Singapore succeed. People must know the PAP not as a remote and impersonal government, Ching Hu, but as a team, their team, as a human personal presence. Your caring MP, your friendly branch sec, people you know, people who have shown that they can get things done for you, people who will help you through your difficulties and improve your lives. And in this effort, every party member has a role to play. You are wearing white. You are carrying the party badge. You may be in mufti, but you are still wearing white and carrying the party badge. If you push your weight around, behave arrogantly, or take advantage of your position, you bring disrepute to yourself and do harm to the party. But if you uphold the party's ideals and serve residents conscientiously and selflessly, you will strengthen the trust between the party and the people, consolidate the party's support base, and help to keep Singapore successful. One very important part of the party's support base is, of course, the labor movement. The PAP has always had a close and symbiotic relationship with the unions. In fact, the party's very beginnings were with the unions. 
Mr. Lee Kuan Yew first made his name in the postman's strike in 1953, when he represented the Postal Workers Union as its lawyer and spokesman, and won them a famous victory against the colonial government. And when Mr. Lee launched the PAP the following year, in 1954, many of the founding members were unionists. Devon Nair, Osman Wok, Samad Ismail, Fong Sui Swan, Lee Gek Singh, just to name a few. Some were communists, covertly, but they were unionists, and they made common cause, they joined the PAP. And the unionists carried the PAP into power. They stood for election, unionists stood for election on the PAP ticket, and that continues even to this day. After we separated from Malaysia and had to build our economy, the need for the PAP government and the unions to work together became even more pressing. We managed to change and abandon the previous confrontational approach to labor management relations of strikes and conflict. We established a tripartism model of win-win cooperation amongst employers, unions, and the government. We made harmonious labor relations a lasting competitive advantage of Singapore, an advantage which attracted investments and created jobs for our people. Over the decades, the PAP and the labor movement have stood together through many difficult times. We went through recessions, big and small. We went through SARS. We went through the Asian financial crisis. Not big enough, we went through the global financial crisis. We still stood together. And because we stayed together, the country thrived and people's lives improved. Whenever Singapore faced a problem, the unions, NTUC, have always stepped up. Whether it is to tighten belts in a recession or to step in to prevent milk powder profiteering. Even in tackling MRT problems, when we are making a major push to improve rail reliability, we depend heavily on the NTWU, the National Transport Workers Union, because we need NTWU's help, union leaders, to maintain workers' morale, to maintain discipline in the workforce. On its part, the PAP has always made policies with the workers' interests at heart. So it's a relationship which goes in both directions. And this symbiotic relationship is now even more crucial than ever. Because workers will need support to cope with economic disruption. Some industries will see job losses, even as we create new jobs and opportunities. Workers will need all the help that the unions can give them. And the unions will need to work with the PAP government so that we can develop effective policies to help workers, to enable Singaporeans to weather the changes, to do their new jobs better. The older union leaders who have worked closely with the PAP government understood this well and strengthened the relationship. Many of you would have known Brother Cyril Tan, the veteran unionist who passed away just this week, last week. I knew Brother Cyril well, too, because for many years he was General Secretary of UWE, the Electronic and Ele Electrical Industries Union, and I was advisor to UWE. I often discuss labor issues with Cyril because he had a good sense of what workers needed. At the same time, he understood the broader national interest, and he could convey that effectively to his members. The NTUC must nurture this same understanding and relationship with new generations of union leaders. So I'm very happy to see the unions represented in force at our party convention this year. If the future union leadership can produce more people like Cyril Tan, then we will be in good shape. We must also nurture this symbiotic relationship at the national level. And that's why when the NTUC Central Committee requested me to send them Chan Chun Singh to be their Secretary General, 
I was happy to agree. I told them only on loan. <laughs> this is why also I have asked the younger ministers to work more closely with the labor movement. At the NTUC Ordinary Delegates Conference a few days ago, NTUC announced that each of the younger fourth generation ministers will take on a specific partnership with the labor movement. And our younger MPs will be involved as well. This will also be a key testing ground for us to identify and develop future leaders and to maintain a close partnership between the party and unions for succeeding generations. The PAP has been successful because our policies have improved the lives of Singaporeans. We deliver on our promises, but good policies depend on good politics. We have to stay close to voters, maintain the trust of the people, keep our base strong, maintain the symbiotic relationship with the NTUC. We have a deep reservoir of trust in the people. We must continue to deepen this trust, never break it. Party members must stay humble, be connected to the ground, so that we are always close to the concerns of Singaporeans and we earn the right to speak for them. And they feel that we are their spokesmen, their champions. Voters will judge us not only by what we have done in the past, but also by what we are continuing to do for them and what they believe we can do to improve their lives in future. So let's convince people, not with words, but with actions. This is the People's Action Party. Let's show them that our future is bright because the PAP is with you, for you, for Singapore. Thank you very much.